Hello, hello, how are you? So, I, uh, my first book I ever wrote, actually my second book was about entrepreneurship in emerging markets, and I was hugely pregnant when I was promoting it, and I did 30 keynotes around the world, and I got to go talk to all these places about why Silicon Valley was so great. And they would look at me like, yeah, we know, shut up. Today, you get to hear about why Silicon Valley is awful. This is the keynote you've been waiting for if you're outside the Silicon Valley ecosystem and sick of the smugness. And I honestly don't know how I'm going to get through all of this in 18 minutes. Um, I have just spent over a year writing a book about my journey from cool girl patriarchy enabler to badass feminist mama bear. And so I've researched every element of this. And we are in the middle of a bro explosion in Silicon Valley that has like had me working around the clock. So I'm going to move super quick. Everything on these slides is sourced. I can send you the slides if you want the data and you want the sources. Just email me afterwards, and we're going to like micro machines speed through this. So we're going to look at where we are, how we got here, and what happens now in this morality crash. And what do I mean by morality crash? You know, when I moved to Silicon Valley in 99, we had an economic collapse. And a lot of the things that people hated about the culture that came in with the dot-com excitement was wiped out by that economic crash. And for years, VCs and entrepreneurs who don't really like bro behavior and this toxic masculinity that we're going to talk about have been waiting for this economic crash to similarly just wipe that stuff out. And it hasn't happened for a lot of reasons we're going to get into. And instead, the excesses have gotten so bad in this toxic bro culture that's, that they have brought the crash down on themselves. And what we're seeing now is a morality crash. So have to go through a couple things because I literally have these conversations. I literally had one of these conversations last night. Yes, the valley is sexist. Here's a shitload of evidence for you. The valley is sexist. No, it is not a pipeline problem. You know, again, read the stats. One of the most shocking ones in this is um, at Stanford and UC Berkeley, 50% of the introductory code classes are women. 50% don't graduate. What happens? We're going to get into that in a minute. Um, their top universities are graduating black and Hispanic computer science and engineering students at twice the rate they're getting hired by the industry. Women are just falling out of the system as they go up, either by choice because they're working in toxic environments, or they're getting this compound sexism of every little time they don't get credit for something, every little time they don't get a promotion, or they become mothers, and maternal bias is one of the most blatant forms of sexual harassment anywhere because a lot of people don't feel like it's sexual harassment. Male bosses think they're helping you by denying you a promotion because you can be a better mother. According to data, white men in the room always get mad when I say this, but according to data, according to what you have told two different studies, you do not care about diversity. Uh, less than 5% of white men say this is a top problem. Uh, some who've been surveyed feel that they shouldn't have to worry about this. It's almost an insult to them as a founder. 40% are sick of hearing about it. Uh, this one get thing I want to point to, 80% of female VCs say they've witnessed sexism in tech. Only 28% of men did. So this conversation we've been having for the last couple weeks where people keep saying, well, this doesn't happen at my firm, or I've never seen this, or these must be outliers. It can't really be this bad. Look at that stat. It is happening even if you're not seeing it. And by the way, there's a race element here, too. A lot of the cases that we've seen that have come out recently, most notably Justin Callback from Binary Capital, had a type, his type was sexually harassing Asian women. A lot of white women pitched Justin Callback and didn't have that experience and were shocked when that information comes out. Even if you're a woman, if you're a white woman, you may be falling into this and not seeing it because you're not facing it. So bro culture is basically a form of toxic masculinity. And we're seeing this everywhere in America right now. We're seeing this when it comes to junior high, and we're seeing this with junior high boys bullying girls into giving them nude photos that they can exchange to upperclassmen for liquor. We're seeing it with our president, who had 13 allegations of sexual assault and sexual misconduct, and his defense was the women were too ugly for him to assault, and he got elected anyway. And we're seeing it in Silicon Valley. 
This is all tied together. It is the slow disenfranchisement of the white man in America, and they're wigging out, and it's breeding this toxic hyper-masculinity. There's this great quote from Joan Williams, who's one of the best gender and discrimination researchers in the country. She uh, published something on Harvard Business uh, this week and said, the hard-driving bro culture confuses the pursuit of money with the pursuit of masculinity. Now, you think about the disruption culture that's been bred in the last 15 years or so of Silicon Valley, where people brag about law-breaking. They maximize for the biggest valuation. I've been a reporter for 20 years. Until recently, entrepreneurs didn't tell you what their valuation was. They considered that competitive insight and intelligence. They didn't want you to know. This has become a bragging point. They have jeopardized the future of these companies, what their employees' sh shares are going to be worth, in order to get the headline saying they're a unicorn or saying they're a decacorn. It has all been about basically saying, this real man syndrome, proving this pre precarious masculinity of look how big and bad and awesome and risk taker and bro -y and baller I am, to, to borrow Uber's favorite uh, word. So it isn't a surprise that if that's how you're going about building companies, grabbing, possessing, and putting women in their place fits that psychological pattern. So everyone in the Valley wants to tell you they're obsessed with data. When it comes to hiring practices, they're not. People will tell you over and over again, you have to work 24 hours a day. Uh, you, if your wife and kids know who you are, you're doing it wrong. If you're not up at 3 a.m. with anxiety, you can't possibly be a founder. This flies in the face of every data that shows how productivity works. I mean, after 50 hours a week, you basically have diminishing returns and risk all sorts of long-term health issues. And startups are a marathon. You know, this isn't 99, where something's going public in eight months. Companies are taking seven to 10 years, increasingly longer and longer to get public. Um, and the, one of my favorite stats, uh, the monthly labor review found that when people say they work more than 75 hours a week, they're lying. Like, you just physically cap out after a point, which is why all these startup offices have game rooms and food and all of these distractions so they can look like they're being at the office for 18 hours a day, but they're not really working 18 hours a day. All the data shows this is not how you build a company. And yet, the expectation in Silicon Valley, one of the things that keeps women, a lot of women, particularly mothers, out of the industry is this, you got to be 24-7 crushing it. Data also shows that companies with female founders perform better. Female VCs perform better. Now that's particularly shocking because a lot of female VCs are ghettoized into sectors like healthcare or e-commerce or corporate venture capital groups, which have the worst proceeds overall. Those are not where the super unicorns come. So the fact that women VCs outperform is remarkable. Over this time that women VCs have been outperforming, the percentage of firms that have a female senior investing partner has been cut in half. There are fewer women getting the job to invest, even though they are statistically delivering the best returns. The number of venture-backed companies, the percentage of venture-backed companies that have a female CEO is 3%. And the percentage of money that goes to those women is less than 3%. It does not match up with the data. So what we're seeing is not just greed. Not we're seeing, what we're seeing is not just people saying, oh, I got to focus on my job. I don't have time or luxury to do the right thing. Like, greed is not influencing the decisions. Toxic masculinity is superseding data. So in 2017, the toxic masculinity bubble has finally popped. We are in the middle of it. There is fuselage everywhere in the valley right now. Um, people are saying it's a witch hunt and they're terrified and people are freaking out and there's backlash cycle and there's all, all kinds of things going on. But we have, starting with Uber, which is not only the highest valued company in Silicon Valley right now, and because Silicon Valley is this home run culture, whoever the highest valued company is, disproportionately impacts the, you know, the entire culture of that, of that era. Um, so starting with you know, Uber, highest value company in Silicon Valley history from a pre-IPO standpoint, $70 billion, never seen anything to this level before. Total founder control. Founder finally gets ousted because of three years of scandals, because the disruption and law breaking that got them so 
all of those billions of dollars, all of those step ups and valuations, all those magazine covers. It turned out they didn't know the difference between breaking taxi laws, breaking labor laws, whether or not you should steal trade secrets. It was just a lawless, toxic organization. The, starting with that, it sent a ripple effect throughout Silicon Valley of if Travis Kalanick can be fired for this, no one's job is safe. Coming on the heels of that, we saw allegations come out about Binary Capital, uh, one of the partners there, systemically sexually harassing women. Not only did he lose his job, the firm is gone. The firm is gone. Now, I'm telling you, I've been in the Valley for 20 years. No one, not even the most hopeful feminist in the world, thought a VC would lose their job for propositioning women, much less use the entire fund. We don't know what ground we're on here. We don't know how big this pop is, just like the dot-com pop in 2000, where people felt like, well, did it really crash? Maybe it'll come back, and there's sort of a year of false hope. I'm sure there's a lot of people who think, well, you know, maybe these are just a couple examples and we'll, we'll move on. I don't think so. I think this has popped, and we're in for a year where a lot of men in Silicon Valley should be scared shitless. So, how do we get here? I'm like so ridiculously out of time, guys, so we're gonna raise through this. Uh, rape culture at Silicon Valley feeder schools is a big part of it. Uh, women on Stanford campus have 43% chance of sexual assault or sexual misconduct, and I know, I know. And the school won't do anything about it. I've spent a lot of time in the last year with Michelle Dauber, who has spent her, she's a tenured Stanford law professor, and they wish she wasn't. They would love to fire her because she has been such a nightmare for Stanford. She continue, she's trying to get the judge in the Brock Turner case recalled, which is a more than million dollar political campaign she's running. Um, and she is constantly bringing this up. They won't even put a light by the dumpster where Emily Doe was assaulted. Stanford will not let sororities serve alcohol at parties. They make them go to fraternity houses if they want to have alcohol. You have 30% higher odds of sexual assault if you go to one fraternity party a month. They are sending women to the point of vulnerability. So again, 50% incoming kids going into computer science. This happens to a lot of them. They become English majors because they no longer can be in this toxic world. You also see it with cheating. Computer science professors at Stanford have written algorithms that prove more than 40% of their kids are cheating. School won't do anything about it. Won't even let them enforce it. Viva disruption. As long as this is going on and celebrated in Silicon Valley feeder schools, we will never solve this problem. And the worst part is, you have major Silicon Valley billionaires who could put an end to this immediately. They give Stanford so much money, they have so much sway over Stanford, one phone call from someone on that board of trustees would make Stanford take this seriously. They won't. This was just gross, and I don't have time to get into it, but you're gonna have to Google it. Stanford Graduate School of Business produced a video where women wearing Stanford clothes were in water fights and groping men. Michelle Dauber, I know, Michelle Dauber put it online and exposed it. This was, their defense was, we were portraying women's positive sexuality. I would ask why an educational institution needs to portray any sexuality of its female students. Faulty pattern recognition. This is one of my favorite quotes, uh, mostly because it basically is this quote. It came up in the Alan Powell trial where John Doerr is ex basically encouraging and giving permission to only invest in young white dudes. He's basically saying, this is how I've made my money. This is how I became the great John Doerr. My favorite part is that he totally forgets Asian Jerry Yang. Like, he just leaves him out of the list because apparently he's not a white male enough, which is crazy. So there's this faulty pattern recognition that just because these are the people who've been funded, well, those are the people who produce the returns. And then the worst pattern recognition is, but Steve Jobs. Every time for the last 10 years, someone has been an asshole, people say, but Steve Jobs. And look, Steve Jobs was a genius. He did a lot of things great. You will never convince me that him denying his daughter and refusing to pay child support was why Apple became the company it did. Okay, cult of the founder. One of the biggest things that's happened in this whole era 
from the dot-com crash on, seeds of all of this go back 20 years, guys, um, has been the cult of the founder. Founders taking more and more and more ownership control so they can never be ousted. What that did was it created a culture of no accountability in the middle of this toxic bro behavior. For three years, I've talked to people on the outside of Silicon Valley saying, I don't understand why Travis Kalanick isn't fired. He couldn't be. He couldn't be. He still really wasn't. He had to agree to step down. We see this at the public company level with dual stock, uh, dual stock classes where they can't be voted down. Um, look, you know, I'm a mother, and let me tell you, if my toddler is misbehaving, I put him in a timeout, I don't give him a bag of sugar. Essentially what happened with this toxic bro behavior was people increasingly gave it more money, more valuation, less oversight. And because these companies weren't going public, that oversight wasn't even kicking in at the public company level. We talked about disruption. Yeah, guess what? When you celebrate and encourage people to break laws, they break more laws. Amazing that no one thought that could end badly. Now to the point where allegedly Uber has actually set up a shell company in order to steal trade secrets from its rival. This is what hustle has become. We didn't have an economic crash. I talked about this a little bit earlier. When everyone was not wanting to address this or do anything about it because they kept hoping this magical economic crash would bring about this cultural change, and frankly, a lot of the VCs were coward because of the cult of the founder. They didn't want to look anti-founder friendly if they tried to rein someone in. They had to play their good dude VC social game. They were hoping the economy would do it for them. And because of uh, you know, low interest rates, people wanting to find returns somewhere, and this glut of foreign money that keeps getting pumped into Silicon Valley, they just miscalculated it, and there was no economic crash. So we've had no natural market reckoning, hence the morality itself brought itself down. And this is just a side note. I mean, you have a valley full of guys who want to talk about how horrible Donald Trump is. They act just like him. They may not share the politics, but they literally do the exact same tactics to the point where if you even look at some of the walk back apologies from the men who have lost their jobs over these sexual harassment scandals, they're calling it witch hunts and fake news. I mean, it's actually amazing that they don't see that they're looking in the mirror. So here's the good news. Unfortunately for all those bros, Trump energized feminism in America. Women of my generation who spent their 20s and 30s with kind of handmaid's tale style blinders on, wanting to pretend sexism didn't exist and didn't, wasn't a thing, we've now gotten just so horrified by the amount of rights that this administration wants to take away from us and the language against women. It has caused this, this huge conversation on a national level about what women have endured that women never wanted to face or talk about before. So you've got all of us in our 30s and 40s and 50s in this industry who suddenly want to be thought of as women in this industry and want to work for and help other other women in this industry, and this has now become our issue. On top of that, you have the millennial generation, and all of that millennial entitlement we've all read so many case studies about is great for women coming up who are millennials, because they are simply not accepting the I gotta pay my dues bullshit that women of my generation accepted. On top of that, you have the teen Vogue generation that basically has a 20-year head start on my generation in accepting that feminism there's a need for feminists, and they want to identify as feminists. We have never had this cohesive and unsplintered a movement for women's rights, certainly since I've been alive in America. And this is exactly what has caused this crash. This is what is bringing these men down. Women are coming forward. They are risking their careers, and they're doing it because they don't want other women to go through what they went through. And other women are helping them. They're bolstering their stories. They're also coming forward and using their names. And other women are calling them heroes. And other women are saying, you inspire me. And other women are then wanting to fund them and work with them. This is, this is what is bringing this down. This is the single change that's happened that has caused this bro reckoning that I think we're only at the beginning of. Ellen Powell was our Anita Hill moment. She didn't get justice at the time. But it was that moment when every woman thought, Oh my God, is this not okay? Everything I've dealt with, every day of my career, we're now agreeing this isn't okay? Without Ellen Powell, you don't have Susan Fowler. Without Susan Fowler bringing down the most protected and powerful bro in Silicon Valley history, you don't have everything that's come out since, and you don't have women starting to go after VCs. 
Okay, where do we go from here? I'm so over time, it's ridiculous. These are all the things men need to stop doing. Uh, number one, uh, memo to Ashton Kutcher, no one asked you to come lead a conversation about this, and if you were going to, maybe talk to a couple women who are victims first. There's a role for men to play in this because men certainly have the bulk of the power, and look, a lot of men are as disgusted by this toxic masculinity as women are, but it's not by co-opting the conversation and, and trying to use the same, uh, <laughs> the same sort of fragile founder ego of wanting to compare evaluations with suddenly wanting to compare wokeness. Uh, beware the walk back. We have, now every single one of these guys has come out and done, given a contrite apology that someone wrote for them and then immediately started backstepping it. Either saying, well, I thought it was a social situation or I need to grow up. It's amazing, these men in their 40s and 50s who still need to grow up and yet are able to run massive multi-billion dollar funds. Um, they just pause before you congratulate someone on their apology is my advice. Because so far they've tried to walk it back every single time. And you know, for God's sake, all these catchphrases, whenever you hear anyone say any of these things, they're part of the system and they're not facing it. But do not hire a known predator. Why do we have to say this? I don't know, but Lightspeed Capital literally lost money because Justin Kalbeck was a predator and gave him a positive reference to LPs when he was raising money for his fund. They directly set him up with a bigger platform to be a bigger predator, and I guarantee all of these men in a couple years are gonna come back in new fancy jobs. Gurbash Chahal, who was caught on tape beating his girlfriend 16 times, is an advisor for a venture firm in Chicago. White men have to stop getting endless chances. If you're in your 40s, you're not in your young mis misogyny phase that all men go through. You are a misogynist, and you cannot work in this industry. W uh, women, I mean, no more cool girlism. We all got sucked into it. I was sucked into it for 15 years, so I'm not judging. But, you know, we got to stop that. We got to stop being e our own worst enemy. Uh, never say he's never done that to me because there's racial overtones to all of this, there's class overtones, there's all kinds of stuff. If a woman says it, just believe her. Um, these are a lot of things men can do. Again, you know, I can, I can share these slides with you guys. There's a lot of interesting software where you can basically James Comey out and put in your details anonymously at the time of what happened, and then you can surface like, oh wow, 16 women seem to have said this about Justin Kalbeck. Maybe this should be, you know, elevated to something we should look at. There's ways the industry could have these sort of cross-firm cross software platforms to make some of this stuff clear. Um, you know, again, a lot of this stuff should be self-explanatory. It's sad that I have to put it on a slide. More simply, these think pieces regarding how to help female founders are making me laugh. Here's how you help. Stop hitting on them when they ask for funding. It's really that simple. Women, speak up, keep receipts, keep doing what you're doing, support other women. We are absolutely changing this industry in fundamental ways that have these guys scared shitless. We have joked that Pando should have a side business selling adult diapers in Silicon Valley. Most importantly, I want you guys to know that you're not alone. This is my personal, very encrypted email address. I'm not even talking about as a reporter. I'm talking about as a woman and as a human being. If someone is doing this to you now and you don't know what to do and you're scared and you don't know what your rights are, email me. There is a massive network of us and the reason this is having impact is because we are all working together and we're all supporting each other and I will help you. I will get you in touch with whoever you need to get in touch with. If I can't help you myself, I will connect you with other people. You are not alone. You are not crazy. This was not your fault, that you did not bring this on you, and we are together going to change this industry. Thank you.